Hi everyone and welcome to another edition of the Peruvian Untold History. My name is Vanessa Vasquez. I am an official professional tour guide in Lima, Peru. I've been guiding for over 17 years in my city and history is my passion. In each one of these videos or even live sessions dedicated to the untold history of Peru, we revise events in our history that are not discussed outside the country. So if you are not from Peru, probably you have never heard about the stories I have explained in this series. And in today's occasion, I want to talk about the tragic history of the first presidents of Peru. So we are transporting ourselves into the end of the colonial period or the viceroyalty period of Peru, the end of the ruling of the Spanish kings and we're going to see the downfall of that regime and of course the beginning of the republica so how it was that transition was it easy was it not well was it successful or not <laughs> we're going to see that today so i really hope you enjoy this video if you can please help me with a thumbs up if you like this type of content also you can leave a comment in the comment section of this video so in that way i know if you like it or what other themes you would like me to cover i also do cooking shows two times a month as well as these events two times a month um and and videos and and so on so i try to keep you very entertained uh, from this part of the world. So first I would like to explain how important was the Spanish Empire in a time of the history of humanity, like how big the empire was. Um, you're going to see in this image I'm sharing that the empire of Spain. It was not just a country, it was an empire. It covered a huge extent of territory. So give a look, for example, to the zones in red. Here you can see, well, that pretty much uh, most of the American continent, North America, Central America, South America, uh, are colored in red. And also in South America, you can see uh, part of the, let's say, the shape of the Viceroyalty of Peru, which is also united uh, with other Viceroyalties that you can see also in the upper part, the Viceroyalty of uh, Nueva Granada and the Viceroyalty of uh, Rio de la Plata. You can see also Spain in the European continent being quite small in comparison of all the lands that they uh, conquer in the Americas. And they also were able to penetrate uh, in the Asian territory. For example, the Philippines, uh, besides different islands uh, in, in, in that part of the Pacific, the Philippines were the most important territories for the Spanish at that time. So it was believed or it was said that in the Spanish Empire, the sun never set. Um, so well, uh, this is really the, the beginning of the story because um, there was a time in which the uh, territory of the Spanish Empire was so big and so uncontrollable oh, that this, let's say, strength of the expansion and extension of this uh, land became the weakness uh, of the uh, ruler because remember that this was a um, empire centralized in a king although the model of the spanish uh, was also in a way uh, very efficient creating by royalties for example in the americas uh, the king was able to pass a lot of his power to someone that was named Viceroy or Vice King, Virrey in Spanish. So um, the Viceroyalties were basically independent in a way, in the way of you know ruling and decisions, for example. They were not controlled by remote control by the king. That's the model of a colony. But Peru was a Viceroyalty, so the Viceroy had the authority as if he was the king. So in the world, 
there were a lot of events happening uh, at the same time of the independences of the uh, South American countries and in particular the independence of Peru, of the Viceroyalty of Peru. So these events uh, influenced a lot in, in these um, initial manifestations of uh, wish of independence. So, well, you can see the independence of the 13 colonies in North America, uh, also the French Revolution, what an important event, of course, in the world's history, Napoleonic uh, invasions of Spain, so Napoleon invaded Spain and also took captive to prisoner the king of Spain for a short period of time, but very important, and, of course, the very indigenous revolutions in uh, this part of the world are indigenous revolutions who were uh, like fires who were rapidly stopped by the Spanish, but well, there was a seed left from these fights in the heart of indigenous, Afro-descents, Criollos, and so on. So finally, well, we achieve this independence. Finally, we consolidate the independence. It was not a very fast, very speedy process, to be honest, and it was not very clear for many people if we were or not independent from Spain. Um, the process of the independence was very complex. So when we learn about the independence of Peru in Peruvian schools, we learn about this very important date, uh, which is July 28th, 1821. So that is the day of the declaration of the independence of Peru. Well, yes, it was the declaration of the independence done in the main square of Lima, as well as in three additional squares the same day because back then there was no radio there was no tv so the liberator of peru jose de san martin the argentinian liberator the general uh, and protector of peru had to do the same proclamation repeated four times in total in the city that same day also the last proclamation was done in the main square of lima around noon around 12 and there was that was a big party so far we know uh, it was a saturday by the way so something interesting is that yes we learned that that is the date of the independence the year of the independence but no because we had a spanish presence until three years after in different parts of the andes of peru so there were many people who in that same date in many parts of Peru, well, they still believe we were by royalty. We had a king, right? So it was a long process. It was not an easy process. And it was not a process that everybody loved and everybody embraced. Because uh, we have a, a saying in, in Peru and part of Latin America, it, it is best to keep, you know, the old bad than the new good, because you don't know how good <laughs> it really is. It can be worse. So there were many people who were afraid of something new, something never seen before. Like we were not a republica before the Spanish presence. We were, of course, dominated by uh, indigenous chiefs, by Inca kings, uh, by shamans, by priests. So there was always an authority ahead that had almighty power, like a complete control in most of the cases of the pre-Hispanic societies of Peru. And then we have this model of a king, of a ruler. So it was not something easy for people to picture in their minds something new, like a republica, like, you know, like a democracy. So, well, uh, not many people supported this idea. So, well, this period, basically lasts for six years, this period of ups and downs in which um, there are a lot of uh, misunderstandings about the independence and we have, of course, lots of um, sort of like pressure from outside the country to become independent. Mm? The liberators of Peru, by the way, 
were, uh, or the most famous liberators, <laughs> were not Peruvian. The liberators of Peru were an Argentinian, Jose de San Martin, and a Venezuelan, Simón Bolívar. Yeah. So those very important figures that we praise, they were not Peruvians. Mm. So, well, um, is this true? Like, was there no Peruvian liberator? Was there no Peruvian hero of the independence? Of course, that's not true. But um, when we think about the liberation, the independence, the, <laughs> the creation of the, the state of Peru, uh, we think in those men. So we're going to talk about the two first presidents of the history of Peru and why they had a tragic story, why their story is tragic in a way. So basically the period we are going to talk about in this video in particular is the process of the creation of the first Congress you know, that was established in September 1822 uh, and that well, lasted until September 1823. Um, the creation of the first Congress also brings the, the establishing of authorities, of new authorities. So before that time, the authority was, well, still for some people, the king or viceroy, but also for the people who embraced the cause of the independence, the authority was, well, the Argentinian general José de San Martín. But José de San Martín, um, decides to pass this authority of protector, that's how he was called, he was never a president, he was a protector to the Congress, and the Congress took the decision of um, pointing out presidents, okay? Um, and this one-year period ends with the arrival of Simón Bolívar. So Simón Bolívar is known in Peru as a Yes, he is a liberator, uh, but he's also known as a tyrant by many historians. He's pointed out to be an authoritarian, tyrant leader uh, who did more bad than good to the country. Yeah, we are not really super fans of Bolivar. Um, but of course, he was a man of his time. And he did what he believed it was necessary for us. But also, I would like to talk about the other side of the hero of the protector, eh, San Martin. So San Martin is usually seen as this figure who eh, was pro the independence and against the, uh, the monarchy model. And that is not true. <laughs> that is not true, amigos. Like um, our hero was indeed trying to change the model and give the American people, give the people from these territories that were uh, named criollos, that were named mulatos, that were named indigenous, that were named mestizos, oh, and so on, because their, his own militia was conformed by people from different ethnicities and different levels of mixing of bloods. Uh, he wanted to give them uh, opportunities um, to achieve certain success, of course, uh, and also uh, to finish with a model that was a very old, a model that was not supported by the uh, by the new generations. No, uh, also we have to remember that these heroes, these military uh, leaders, they were part of the Freemasons. Oh, so if you are familiar with that, you probably will understand why they were looking for achieving something completely different than the, uh, the monarchy system. Our hero wanted or preferred a constitutional monarchy. So when we talk about a constitutional monarchy, we have to talk about, for example, the model of England. Oh, so a model that has a king uh, sitting in a throne or it could be a queen right but there is a constitution there is a, a congress there is a prime minister right so that is what san martin believed was the best for peru 
Um, and, and that's because well, we simply were not prepared for something different. Um, we didn't have the, um, the knowledge uh, to be self-sufficient. Uh, we were always commanded. We were always directed. Uh, so passing from you know, being a, a baby or uh, a, a child to live alone in your apartment, like that would be chaos. Oh, and he realized that the best thing for Peru was a constitutional monarchy. So who would be the ruler of this land? Um, this question was dropped at some moment, uh, and it was believed that, for example, a European prince could come. It could be a prince from, um, for example, from England. It could be a prince from Germany. It could be a prince from Spain, no? but someone that will have this royal regal authority and that would like to come and rule this land and, of course, do it aligned to the, to the new system, to the new form. No? San Martin really insisted in this constitutional model. Uh, there were many people in Lima when he arrived to the city, declared the independence in 1821, who were loyal royalist who saw with good eyes the independence and uh, unlike this sort of like in between system like a uh, authority that was regal but also more opportunities for everybody uh, not just the spanish on top ruling and leading or oh, um, so people like that idea and they sided with the independentist band because of that uh, project. And well, the story says that there is a moment in which he realizes uh, he needs support from outside because remember there still were Spanish troops, royalist troops in the Andes. So he was in the coast, he was in Lima, he was not in the Andes, he was not in the center of the country. So there was resistance from the uh, from the side of the um, uh, the people that were loyal to to the king of Spain, and these people were in the South Andes in particular, uh, in Arequipa, for example, in Cusco. So well, uh, San Martin goes to ask support uh, to uh, Bolivar. They meet in Guayaquil, nowadays Ecuador. Uh, and there is an interview that we don't know what happened in this interview uh, because it was secret. It happened between closed doors. That's the only time documented in the history when these heroes were together in person. We know they exchanged letters, but they were able to meet uh, in person. And uh, we don't know what happened. We don't know what happened then. Well, it uh, seems that the interview, this meeting didn't end so well, at least from the perspective of the Argentinian hero. He returned to Peru and he just rapidly uh, like creates the Congress, establishes, you know, like authorities. Uh, he creates a triumviratum, which is three different leaders ruling at the same time, of course, given different powers, right? Um, and he just left Peru. The Congress is established and uh, there is an authority, uh, Luna Pizarro, uh, which was a priest, by the way. <laughs> so our uh, first president of the Congress of Peru was a priest. Mm -hmm. In Peru, we have a lot of relation between the church and the state. The first Congress was created on September the 20th, 1822. Uh, it was located in the campus of San Marcos University. Mm -hmm. uh, and, well, we have here uh, a Congress established that had 79 people in total, of course, all men, all men, well-educated, of good families and origins. Um, we can understand that most of them were uh, what we call criollos, which means descendants of Spanish, but uh, born in America. We also had some mestizos, mixed blood, 
but uh, most of them were uh, genetically, you know, European descent. We have 28 lawyers, 26 priests, eight doctors, nine merchants, five military personnel, uh, and also very wealthy foreigners that lived in Peru back then. But this time uh, of the history and the creation of the Congress uh, was really a time of chaos. It was very distant to being a bed of roses. Um, it was a time of persecutions. It was a time of people realizing that the independence was not always the best. Um, especially, I think, that the ones who were the most uh, sad of supporting the independence were the very criollos, the people who were descendants of the Spanish, and also the Spanish who decided to affiliate to the independence, uh, because later they realized that they will always be discriminated. They were not respected, their lands were not protected, their toy titles were not respected, they had to quit their titles. So um, there was a, a witch hunt uh, against the the people who were uh, Spanish or who were Criollos. Uh, and that we know uh, very good even later during the time of Bolivar. Bolivar, that's why he was so hated. Bolivar um, persecuted anyone <laughs> who was, uh, or, or let's say was connected at some point with the Spanish um it's a novelty that live here in Peru. We had a lot of active novel titles in Lima at the time of the independence. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, it was a hard time for, for that people. And, well, that's the reason why uh, the story of our first presidency is so tragic. The independence was granted, uh, but, uh, well, it was a freedom by force in a way. 95% of the Royalist troops were Peruvian, uh, while 20% of the independentist troops were Peruvian, right? So can you see that? Like how much support the independentist troops had from the Peruvian people? Well, not really much, uh, because most of those troops were conformed by Colombian, Venezuelans, Panamanians, Argentinians, and Chileans. And you might be wondering why Chileans would like to come to fight in Peru or Equatorians or Colombians. Well, they were paid for doing that job. Like that was not just from their heart that they wanted to help us. Well, it was of course the cost of those days, but you could make a lot of money as a soldier from the sacking, from, you know, the stealing from, and also from the payments done from your generals. The first president of Peru was José de la Riva Agüero. And José de la Riva Agüero was a very rich nobleman. He was not your average Peruvian. So José de la Riva Agüero uh, had um, all the opportunities in life to thrive as a very important, uh, let's say, pro-Spanish man with novel titles, of course, uh, lands, wealth, trips, and more. So he was son of a Spanish nobleman born in Lima. He traveled to Spain when he was very young and even studied there. His parents wanted him to pursue a military career, but he was not really into the military arts uh, so much. He preferred science, for example. Uh, he preferred to study history of the world. He preferred to travel different countries. In, he traveled in Europe a lot. Uh, he even had contact with Masonic lodges, uh, with Freemasonry in England and France. Uh, so he had a, a, a very interesting life uh, in, his, in his Jude. Uh, he returned to Peru uh, and he rapidly became involved in the independence process. Um, even though he was a man so rich and he um, he was not like moved like for most people, no, the independence was um, an opportunity to escalate socially or uh, to be able to achieve a better life and so on. He had already all of that. So he didn't need it uh, to fight and be involved in, this, in these revolutions. Um, 
so well he did it because he really trusted in this model he believed in this model but so he participated as an informant as an spy uh, because he already was very close to the higher spheres the ruling spheres of the country uh, so we're talking about the novel people associated or affiliated with the um, uh, with the king and the, and the viceroy so um, he used the information he was able to recollect to help uh, San Martin, even though San Martin was not yet here in this country, he was uh, on his way to Peru. No, um, so he also supported San Martin all the time he was here in Peru. So since his arrival to his departure, uh, he sent letters with important information. So he put himself in high risk, uh, himself and his family as well. San Martin gave him uh, a very high position and that was a really expected uh, way of treatment from San Martin. The failure of the system of Triumviratum three rulers ruling at the same time, uh, created by San Martin, caused uh, the militaries to raise in arms, proclaiming Rivaguero president of Peru. But remember that Rivaguero was not a military man. He was not man of a military career. Um, but he was a person uh, who, well, because of his status, could deal with the situation of being a president. So this is a, a, a very important moment in the history of Peru. It's the first golpe de estado of the history of Peru, or coup uh, of Peru's history. Also, uh, the Congress people, the general people, believe that Ribaguero was un unworthy and untrustworthy because he was the son of a Spanish novel. Uh, so the Spanish nobleman, remember, was seen now as the enemy, right? So the Congress attempted to undermine him by bringing a general, giving this general a higher power, Sucre. Mm, he was a foreign military officer, of course, terribly offended. Uh, our president goes away from Lima and finds refuge in Trujillo, in the north coast of Peru. He even created another congress there, and he closed the Congress of Lima. But the people in the Congress of Lima, of course, didn't accept it, the words of that president, and they put another president <laughs> <laughs> at the same time. So it means that we had two presidents and two Congress also at the same time uh, for a period of several months in Peru. Hmm? This is madness, but that's how bad it was. Well, later he was arrested also by the mans of uh, Bolivar and he fleed the country. Uh, he had a still very, very good friends in different spheres in the military. So uh, he was able to escape that one because he was supposed to be killed for treason. Mm. Um, so well, he escapes to Europe. His story is, in my opinion, sad because uh, we were not really prepared for a president in those days. We're definitely not prepared at all uh, for uh, this model. And now we're going to talk about the second president of Peru, José Bernardo de Torre Tagle, the only Peruvian liberator. He, in rank, was even higher uh, uh, than our first president. He was heir of the title of the fourth Marquis of Torre Tagle, and he became interested in the independence uh, quite early in his life. Um, so, in 1812, he traveled to Spain as a deputy from Lima. Uh, well, we still had a king in Spain, of course. Uh, while well, the king of Spain is held uh, hostage uh, by Napoleon. Mm? So, in Spain, he becomes convinced of Peru's independence. In Peru, he is elected intendant of Trujillo, and in 1820, he proclaims the independence of Trujillo. 
Uh, so yeah, Trujillo became independent first than Lima. Most people don't know that, but Trujillo is also the the land uh, where the independency was first embraced, and that's why the department where Trujillo is located is named La Libertad or the Freedom. Hmm? In 1823, he is appointed as second president of Peru. Remember that we had this fiasco of the first president going away, flitting uh, from Lima to Trujillo and creating his alternative Congress there. So, um, well, our second president, Torre Tagle, uh, takes uh, the, the power, uh, accepts the honor of being second president he was uh, appointed by the first congress of course <laughs> in lima and well he knows that this would be very challenging so he of course believes in the uh, constitutional monarchy model uh, like that was the way how people here felt also persuaded like a felt tempted in a way to embrace the independence uh, so uh, remember that also he was in touch of Freemasonry. He learned about Freemasonry. Well, look how important was being a Mason in uh, that period oh, and how the Freemasonry moved people in the direction of the independences. When Bolivar arrives later, Simon Bolivar uh, was this authoritarian figure that was feared by the Spanish as well. The member that the Spanish were still in the Andes. Um, Bolivar comes invited by the Congress. No? Uh, and he is given by the Congress, the same Congress that appointed Torre Tagle as the second president of Peru, more power <laughs> than uh, the one uh, that our president had. Also, oh, our president probably was very confused, but he still accepted, of course, this because he realized Bolivar could move more people, like could have more authority also in the time needed. Uh, but he didn't know that Bolivar's intentions was also to destroy completely uh, the beliefs uh, in, in a constitutional monarchy. Bolivar didn't like that model. Bolivar hated the model of constitutional uh, monarchy. And probably that's the reason why the interview with San Martin in Guayaquil failed. Because San Martin comes to this man asking him for support and also showing him his project. And Bolivar says, no, no, my friend. Like, the Americas will be something very different. We are going to be uh, sort of like a United States uh, of Latin America. So, will be states, but there will be one ruler, one ruler for all of this tremendously big land. America for the Americans, and I will be the leader. <laughs> so, well, uh, Definitely, San Martin says, no, this is not what I want. I don't think this is the best for our people. And that's how the conversations come to the end. Mm. Torretagre realizes finally that he made a terrible mistake and that he put <laughs> all his uh, support in a system that was no longer intended to be in, in the original way, the original plan. So, well, uh, he resents from his decision. In February 1824, a rally is held at Real Felipe. Real Felipe is a fortress that um, was built between the years 1747 and 1774 uh, as a customs, in a way, for the city as a place of protection for the goods of the city after the destruction of the original town of Callao by a tsunami that happened in 1746. The story of that place is fascinating. If you want to know more about it, let me know it. So, well, um, Real Felipe becomes a bastion for the last Spanish uh, left standing in this territory. Um, this 
place that was of course taken by San Martin during the independence process uh, then later became um, also uh, a zone for, for soldiers for uh, Argentinian most of them soldiers who were left here unpaid they were waiting for being paid remember being a soldier supporter of the liberators was not just an act of goodness like people were really working this was a job and they were expected to be paid and many of these people were not being paid like uh, nothing of the salaries promised to them so um, they rebel against the congress against you know like uh, the authorities that were appointed here in lima because uh, yeah they are not being paid and that is an occasion used as an opportunity by the um uh, well, now uh, very saddened and repented <laughs> um, Spanish and fellow Spanish who realized that, well, the democracy didn't exist, uh, uh, this system collapsed. So they said, okay, we will go to the fortress, we're going to lock ourselves in, and we're going to wait until the Spanish comes to rescue us. They believe that. They truly believe that. Before that happened, before the Spanish fled and took refuge in the Real Felipe Fortress, um, of course, the president, uh, uh, Torre Tagle, had a job, of course. Uh, the job he had was to, for example, ease any, any fires, any problems that were uh, happening uh, around among the, the troops, for example, the, the soldiers, right? unhappy soldiers. Remember that there was a group of unhappy soldiers in the Fortress Real Felipe uh, that demanded, of course, to be listened, to be here by an authority. So uh, Torre Tagle goes, has an interview with them, and well, he is not able really to solve anything, to pay them anything. But Simon Bolivar learns about this meeting. And I think he was, and not just me, of course, most historians believe that this was taken as an excuse, this meeting uh, between the second president and those military men uh, in, in the, those rebellious men, of course, in the fortress, was seen and used as an excuse uh, for Bolivar to demand his immediate imprisonment, the imprisonment of President Torretagli. So, well, Torretagli learns about this uh, decision in, in Lima, back when he was in Lima, uh, and, well, he becomes very worried. So that's the time when there's a big group of fellow Spanish that wanted to return to the, to the arms of Spain, uh, a group, and they decide to go to the fortress all together and lock themselves in. So uh, Torretagle says, well, what can I do? Mm. So he didn't quit his job as a president. He went inside the fortress, and there's a lot of investigation done on this topic. Like, for example, uh, when when group of historians believe that he just wanted to have a um, the opportunity of leave Peru and go, you know, out of the country to find uh, protection in maybe Chile, for example, because this was completely unfair. And he knew he had more support from people who were followers of San Martin, so Chile, Argentina, than from, for the peop from the people of the North who were supporters of Bolivar's mentality. So he wanted to go down to Chile. Uh, but another group of historians believe that he really repented completely of the independence. And well, being in the Fortress Real Felipe was also an act of, you know, like sort of like asking the king for forgiveness. He sent it also, so far we know, a letter to the king. Uh, and and it, it felt like that letter was sort of like repenting of his position. But also there are detractors who says that that letter was made up. It was not really his letter. No? Um, so, well, it, his story ends really sad. He perished inside the uh, fortress with hundreds of people uh, who awaited nearly two years uh, for the Spanish troops, for the Spanish ships that were supposed to come, that never, never came 
sadly. Uh, so we can imagine the desperation they had. The days passed and passed. The food uh, was more scarce. There was, was there was no water. Um, they were um, like seeing really hell uh, in, in, in life. Um, so the story says that Torre Tagle dies exchanging a spoon of gold for a chicken. And he was not able to resist uh, um, more um, the, the lack of food. Uh, he dies with his wife and with uh, some children. Of he, ha he had several children. He had children also that were able to continue his lineage outside the fortress, but he went to the fortress with his little children and who died with him. So Torre Tagle died victim of scurvy and also hunger on September 26, 1825. Uh, his wife and one of his sons also. Uh, also, he had daughters who died with him, but one of his male sons, uh, very important also for that time, male heirs uh, to pass the, the status and, and the, uh, let's say, the titles uh, uh, also they met the same tragic death uh, and tragic faith inside. Oh. So they lasted inside the fortress for nine months. Mm. Um, and this is how the tragic story of our second president comes to an end. Um, well, this is a story of, of two presidents, but how many other famous and not so famous characters also died like that oh like thinking that the independence was the most terrible mistake uh, they they did and they support so in today's video we're able to revise different moments and and characters uh, of this very initial period of the independence but the history goes on the history continues so if you would like to learn more about peruvian history well this is your place in youtube this is your channel uh, you can suggest topics for the future at any time please feel free to comment uh, also if you want to uh, know from where i got the information besides of course i use a lot of uh, books and, and i love to revise them but i also uh, find uh, videos on on youtube that are of course well documented that are done by historians a very very good tool for these videos i do for you in youtube uh, my resources my videographic resources are in in Spanish so if you want to practice your Spanish if you know Spanish um, those videos are also attached in the description of this video so later you can click down and see that very long list of videos highly recommended all of them as I said before I have curated the origin of the information previously um, and also I invite you for my next video my next video is going to be about a, something completely different we're going to leave history for a moment aside and I would like to talk about the sacred plants of the pre-hispanic times so we're going now uh, more into the natural <laughs> or even holistic uh, medicine and we will explore different plants and different products that were considered sacred in the pre-Hispanic times, uh, how they were used and how they are still used in this moment. So this ancestral knowledge cannot be forgotten and we are going to protect this knowledge and defend this knowledge also in this channel. So if you want to know more about those sacred plants of ancient Peru, um, please stay tuned to my next video. So, well, I hope you enjoyed this one and thank you so much to my Patreons who are the supporters of this uh, video, of this, uh, not just this one, so many other. Uh, you can see also a list of my uh, supporters on Patreon. You can become a Patreon if you wish. It's a very simple form to uh, support monthly with a little little fee uh, this channel uh, also you can donate on PayPal uh, anytime you wish 
uh, PayPal is a very good way also to support videos like this one from all over the world. Well, it was a pleasure to have you and have a lovely, lovely rest of the day. See you soon also in another video and I hope to see you also in my next cooking class. Well, have a lovely day. Bye, 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 amigos. Ciao.